Well, we're going to jump into this series this morning, and we've been talking about this for a few weeks now, Lost Christians. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm not talking about loss for eternity. It could lead to that. But what I'm talking about are people who say, I know Jesus, but are just wandering out in life, doing their own thing, seem like they're lost when it comes to their purpose, not fulfilling God's will for their life, lost to find is no longer attained, something that needs to be found, having gone astray, missed the way, bewildered, as in it's amazing how many confused Christians I see, I see them almost every week. Seems like all the time I'm out somewhere, I'm in the store, or I'm out going out to eat, or I'm out doing something. And I'm brushing shoulders with somebody that maybe used to attend church, or I used to know them as a believer. And how are you doing? Man, I'm doing okay. Where are you going to church? Man, I'm not, I'm not really in church right now. People that I've seen kneel their, uh, themselves at this altar, and they've, they've given their life to Christ, and, and they've said, Lord, use me. People that I've actually seen engaged in ministry, doing God's will, out just doing their own thing. These are the lost Christians that I'm talking about. Not used a good purpose as opportunities, time and labor, wasted, destroyed or ruined, preoccupied, distraught, desperate and hopeless. And so for the past few weeks, we've been trying to use as a guide, let's put that next graphic up here. These are the things that we've been talking about. To lay the groundwork into this series, we, we spent a few weeks on what does it mean to seek first the kingdom. We got in Matthew 4, 17 and we defined repent. What does that really mean? We defined what the kingdom of God was and we tried to let, let you know that we're not part of this world anymore. We're part of the kingdom, and so we got to live for the kingdom. These last few weeks now, I think this is our third week now, we've been talking about, does Jesus have all of your heart? And then after this week, hopefully we'll be able to get into these next three messages, the truth about purpose. Do you know your assignment in embracing the will of God? Let's go ahead for review's sake. Bill, this is what we've been talking about. Does Jesus have all of your heart? Let's put up this next graphic. These, this is review. Jeremiah 17. What, what, what do you mean, Pastor? I, I, I prayed the prayer of salvation. I kneeled down at the altar. I said, Jesus, I believe in you. Please come and live in my heart. It's so much more than that. When you prayed the prayer that was the beginning of your journey, but you've got to understand that when you gave your heart to the Lord, you brought all your junk and all your past and all your trauma and all your hurt and all your pain, you brought all that into your relationship with the Lord. And the Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. It's desperately wicked. Who can know it? And even though we're saved and even though our name is written in heaven, even though Jesus has come and taken residence within our heart, the human side of us, we can't trust. And so we've got to learn to live a life that's, that's sacrificial. We've got to take up that cross every day so we can follow the Lord. And then we got into these foundational lessons. And I'm going to breeze through these really quick, Bill. And this is what we talked about last week. We got into the life of, of Peter and Judas, and we talked about the fact that both of them served Jesus. Both of them laid hands on the sick. Both of them cast out devils. But yet when it was all said and done, they both turned their back on Jesus. But Peter returned, and there was a difference between the heart of Peter and the heart of Judas. And that's why Peter was able to return and not Judas. And I ended last week, and I said, a lack of full commitment always has a way of watering down our attention to detail and our allegiance to cause. And so we're now we're really getting into the heart of this about, does he really have all my heart? What's the Bible have to say about this? Let's put this next graphic. And so we talked about the definition of whole as we close, that it means compromising of the full amount. Does Jesus have my whole heart? I don't know. Does it comprise of the full amount and the extent of your heart? Is it without delusion? Have you deluded things? Have you deluded truth? Have you deluded walking the way you know you should be walking? It means complete. It means containing all of the elements. Does Jesus have your whole heart? Let's put this next graphic up. We ended with this statement as we stood. Wholeheartedness in our servitude to, the, servitude to the Father is a dedicated state of devotion that pleases God. Listen, because it demonstrates our full desire to honor Him. It is displayed in our lives, here it is, through our faithfulness to the details of obedience. And this is where we find ourselves today. And we find it in James chapter 1. I believe that's my opening scripture today, James chapter 1. 
verse 22 through 25. What, what's the next graphic on that, Bill? I might have one before. The, okay, here. Matthew chapter 20, 22, I'm sorry. Let's look at this together. Let's pray real quick. Father, we thank you for this message. We thank you for this series. I thank you, God, for these truths that we're getting ready to discuss today. And Lord, I know we're going to just go even deeper today. But Lord, I pray that all of us are going to lay ourselves before you and, and we're going to allow the Holy Spirit to search our hearts, to challenge our relationship with you. And Holy Spirit, have your way. Let your truth make us free in Jesus' name. Say it together with me. Amen. 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 So Jesus comes in in Matthew 22. And he talks about the level of commitment that we ought to have to him. And as we read this, we've got to understand that our faithfulness to God is displayed in our lives through our commitment and our faithfulness. It is more than just a mouth confession. It, it, it is more than just saying, I love Jesus. Because Jesus comes in here in Matthew 22, and says, when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together, verse 35, and we're going to read to verse 40. And one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him, and he, he began to tempt him, and he said this, Master, what's the great commandment in the law? Verse 27, or 37, excuse me, and Jesus said unto them, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul. And all of your mind. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, it's relationship. It's not religion. Jesus, I give you my whole heart. Jesus can determine the details as to the relationship that we have with him. And the thing that we've got to understand, we don't determine that. Because, you know, if we were going to determine that, then how many of you, have you know that we, we probably wouldn't serve the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength? if we were the ones that determined that. But Pastor, I thought that salvation was a free gift of God. It is. I thought that salvation was given through faith. It is. But you can't just give a half-truth when it comes to our salvation. You have to preach the whole gospel, the full counsel of God. And I have to teach you the truth, no matter how hard it is. And Jesus said, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, verse 38. We're going to dive a little bit deeper. You're going to understand what this means before this message is over. This is the first, and this is the great commandment, verse 39. And the second, ooh, we're going to get into some stuff today. The second is like this. Now Jesus comes in and says, now if you say you love me, it will be displayed by the way you live your life. Jesus says that, that if you really understand what relationship with me is all about, then it's going to be evident by the way you now treat one another. Hello. And he says, you're going to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and the second is like it's connected. You're going to love your neighbor as yourself. How many of you know we do a pretty good job loving ourselves? Oh, come on. Let me see your hand. Don't. I don't want to lose you now. Come on. This is too early in the, in the message to lose you. Let me see the hand. How many of you know we do a good job in loving ourselves? Come on. You know, you know we all love ourselves. We got up this morning. You took a shower. You washed your hair if you have it. You shaved your bald head if you, if you shave it. Every, you know, come on, you got ready. You brushed your teeth. You got your clothes all ready. You love yourself. You fed, you fed yourself today, right? We all love ourselves. We take care of ourselves. And so Jesus says the way you take care of yourself, you make sure your needs are met. You make sure that when you're going through an issue that you're taken care of. Jesus said love your neighbor just like that. And he says, the way that you show the world that you love me, it's more than just showing up to church. It's more than just reading your Bible. It's more than listening to BGL set on your memory dial on your radio in your car. He says, it's displayed by the way you live your life and treat other people. Verse 40. On these two commandments hang all of the law. And all of the prophets. 
Well, Pastor, where else is that in Scripture that talks about the fact that the way I live my life confirms the fact that I'm saved? Well, James chapter 1, I love James. I, I, I absolutely, <laughs> James, one of my favorite books of the Bible. James just sometimes is just a punch in the gut sometimes with truth. I mean, he just, it's like the New Testament book of Proverbs. And right off the bat, right in James, the first chapter, James comes in and he's like, I'm going to deal with all you in the church because you got to understand the church was already established at this time. And so the Holy Spirit through James addresses this and he says, listen, we're going to get this straight right now. Being a Christian and saying you love the Lord doesn't necessarily mean that you're really living like you love the Lord. And he comes and he says, this is genuine faith right here. Be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. And he says that if we just hear the word and we don't live out what we say we believe, this is what he says, you're walking in deception. You're deceiving yourself. Verse 23. For if anybody be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's likened to a man that beholds his natural. Now, a glass would have been a mirror then, okay? So basically he's saying, you look at your face in a mirror, and all of you probably did that at least once before you left your house today. You look at your face in the mirror, and why do, you, why do you look at yourself in the mirror? Why do you look at your image in the mirror? Why do you do that? Because you want to see what needs changed. Come on, who's with me? Am I right? You want to see what needs changed. Do I got a wild eyebrow hang? I got to trim it? You know, that's, that's why I have Jovi. You know, all the time she's like, mm, let me get that. I didn't see it. She saw it. I didn't see it in the mirror, but she saw it. Some of you, you wanted to fix your hair up, right? You wanted to, ladies, you wanted to do your makeup. And you, you, why? And you looked in the mirror. And when you put your clothes on, some of you glanced by the mirror. You wanted to make sure everything was in order. You hit all the buttons. Everything's all in order, right? So the reason why you look in a mirror is because you want to see, does there need to be an adjustment? Am I right? Come on. How many of you, right before you left the house, you glance in the mirror and you're like, thank you, Jesus, that I just saw that. I missed the button or my zipper's unzipped or, or, you know, so this is going on, you know, it, it's, but that's why. And that's what the Lord's trying to say. He's using a natural example and he's saying, listen, the reason why you get in the word is because you let the word show you what needs to be adjusted. Just like a mirror. You look in the word and you say, wow, woo. That word contradicts the way I'm living. I need to make some adjustments. But what the Lord is saying is that when the Lord shows you what needs to be adjusted, you need to follow through with it and carry it out because that shows you have relationship with Jesus. Let's look at the next verse, verse 24 and 25. He says, for he beholds himself and then he goes his way. This is what happens when we hear the word and we don't adjust what needs to be adjusted. Like somebody that looked into a mirror and then you saw the image and you saw what needed to be changed, but you just walked away and you forgot what manner of man you were. Verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. And so now he's bringing the analogy. Now he's coming in and he's saying, this is what it is. And, and this is what I love about the wording here is that the word is the law of liberty. I want you to hear me. When you look in the mirror, it's not because you're a bad person. It's because you want to see what needs changed. And, and you're liberated when you see what needs to be changed and you make the adjustment, right? That's, there's a liberty that takes, Woo! thank you, Jesus. Man, I caught that. You know, I went out and had salad and I was walking around and I had a salad leaf waving at everybody in my front tooth. Thank you. I looked into the mirror. Amen. Now, if you don't have a mirror, you got a wife for that. She'll let you know real quick. Amen. Yeah, you need to get a tooth. When your wife hands you a toothpick, guys, I'm just saying, man, you guys are tough today. I'm, I'm going to repeat that joke again. When a wife hands you a toothpick, she's looking out for you. It's funny because Joey, she'll see a string hanging off. She'll see a wild eyebrow that's just deciding to just point straight outward. Or we'll go out to eat. And this is what she does. It's because I got your back. That's what she says. I got your back. <laughs> that's what the word does. 
So when you get in it and it exposes something in your relationship with the Lord that's not lining up with what you're really living, this is the Holy Spirit saying, I got your back. I'm trying to show you some truth. I'm trying to help you. You got some things that need to be dealt with. Let the truth make you free. So if we see that law of liberty and we live out what was exposed by the Holy Ghost and we're not a forgetful hearer but a doer, we obey, we carry it out. This man shall be blessed in his deed. When we read James chapter 1, verses 20 through, through 25, it explicitly, without argument, tells us that unless we have works, unless we have a lifestyle that accompanies what we declare or what we say we believe, listen, it says our faith isn't genuine. And it actually is telling us our relationship with the Lord isn't where it needs to be. Let's put up 1 John. Whew, man, we're going to get deep. If we say that we have fellowship with him. Now, we're going to talk about this here in just a second. And we're going to talk about the difference between relationship and religion. Okay? How many of you believe that? It's a relationship and it's not a religion. How many of you believe that? Well, Jesus, come on. It's a relationship with him, right? It's not a religion. It's a relationship. Well, if I say that I felt, now, it, when you look up that word fellowship, it really talks about relationship. And so what it's saying is, if I declare, okay, remember James says, you, you got to have, you got to be a doer of the word. So if I declare, I have a relationship with Jesus, I have fellowship with him, but I continue to walk in darkness. What does that mean? I'm doing those things that the Bible says, as I looked into the mirror, the Bible says, this is sin. The Bible says, this isn't pleasing to the Lord. The Bible says, this is part of the lust of the flesh, and you need to crucify this. Whatever it is, if I continue, now I get it. I want you to hear me. I get it. All of us are at different levels in our walk with the Lord. So we're all maturing. I, and listen, when I first got saved, I carried a, a lot of darkness in my salvation. And it took me a few weeks, a few weeks, a few months, you know, to purge out the cussing and to purge out smoke and sin. Now, God healed me instantly. Drugs, alcohol, all that stuff, instantly, boom, instantly. But I was still smoking cigarettes. And I remember that when I was sitting in my li living room one time, I was, I was reading the Bible. I was in there, and the ashes fell on the Bible page. And I was like, and the Holy Spirit was like, is that real fruitful? And it was like, the Lord's like, you're addicted to that. You can't even put it down while you're reading the Bible. And of course, you know, how many of you have ever been there before when you're saved and the Lord tells you to do something? I remember driving down the road and I was like, today's the day, Jesus. And I'd crumple up that pack of cigarettes and I'd throw it out the window. And I'd get about a mile down the road and I'd turn the car around. Oh, what did I just do? What did I do? Yeah. Of course, back then they weren't five, six dollars a pack, you know. They, I'm dating myself here. But we're all in a different place in our walk with the Lord. But as we continue to grow and we continue to have a relationship, it's just like any relationship, it grows with time. And so as you continue to grow in the Lord and you say, I've got a relationship with Jesus, but you continue to walk in darkness and you continue to disobey the truth that the Lord, as you see it in the mirror that James talks about, and he reveals you, this is sin, you shouldn't be doing it, and you continue to do it. This is what the Bible, I'm not, I didn't say this, this is what the Bible says. You're lying. You're lying, and you're not living out the truth. Look at verse 7. But if we walk in the light, here's the relationship. Remember, verse 6 says fellowship with him. So it continues the thought. But if I walk in the light, I'm having relationship with Jesus, and I walk in that light because he is in the light. Here we are, and I have fellowship, a true relationship with Jesus. One with another, not one-sided. It's two-way. And the blood of Jesus will continue to cleanse me from all my sin. This is the lesson we learned. Full obedience is what God expects. And full obedience shows, listen, that we are truly serving the Lord. And that we really have a relationship with him. Jesus, even in John chapter 14, verse 21, says, If we love him, we will keep his commands. Or you get this. He that has my commands and keepeth them, he it is that loves me. 
So it's not a question on whether he loves us. That, we're, we're, we've gone past that. Okay? This is the relationship part. This is the after salvation part. This is where you, okay, Lord, I love you. Okay, keep my commands. And he that loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will manifest, I will reveal myself. That's what that means. Jesus said, I will continue to reveal myself to him. So you got, you got to understand, oh boy, I don't have this in my notes, but you got to understand, when Jesus said, many shall come to me in that day and say, Lord, we did these things, we, we cast out devils, and, and we preach in your name, and, and, and we did all these wonderful things in your name, and Jesus says, depart from me, I never knew you. When you look up that word new in the Hebrew, what, what it's referring to is an intimate relationship that's only shared between a husband and a wife. There's details about me that only Jovi, it's reserved only for her. Are y'all listening to me? There's details about Jovi only reserved for me. Why? Because we're married. We're in covenant. We know each other in a way. No, and, that, and it's reserved only for that spouse. Are y'all getting this? And so Jesus says, I will manifest. What that means is there's going to be a revelation of me that's only reserved for those who have intimate relationship with me. That's what he's saying. How many of you want that kind of walk with the Lord? And then he goes on in John chapter 14, verse 15. It says this. If you love me, keep my commands. And then I think, do I have verse 23 and 24 in there, Bill? Then verse 23, Jesus answered and said, if you love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and will come unto me and we will make, now he gets even deeper. He says, we're going to make our abode with you. Oh, hallelujah. How many of you want that kind of relationship with Jesus? That Jesus is just not somebody at a distance that you kind of heard about and you say, oh yeah, I believe in him. But every day you walk with him and you talk with him and, and, and he shares a relationship with you and shares intimate details of what he wants to reveal to you. And that's the kind of walk. How many of you want that? Come on. It's about relationship. It's not religion. I, I, I want the Lord to have his abode with me. I, I want to be the temple of the Holy Spirit that at all times I'm so intimate with God that even when my emotions are screaming at me, I hear his voice. That still small voice. It's still there because he made his abode with me. Let's look at that next verse. Verse 24. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which you hear is not mine, but it's the Father. Are you seeing the pattern here? And, and, and right here in Scripture, it's, it's right before you. That whatever we confess, there will be a lifestyle that backs it up. That, that serving the Lord is more than just, I love Jesus, or I come, to, that's great, say it. And coming to church, yes, that's all part of it. But it's the way you live. So now we're going to go even deeper. Here we go in lesson one, half-heartedness. Wow. Half-heartedness. You know, it, it's funny. I wonder if the Lord treated us in the way he showed his love to us, the way we serve him. Half-heartedness. I mean, I know we're, listen, I know we all deal with struggles, and there's going to be a time or two that this happens, and I get it. But how many times do we come to church and we're like, I don't want to be there. <laughs> now, hear, now, hear me out. How would you feel if you heard Jesus say, I don't want to be there? Come on, come on. Am I right? How, how, if you heard Jesus say, I don't want to fellowship with you today, how would you feel? If the Lord did that. But, but yet we can do that to the Lord, right? I mean, come on, God, God's, God's a God of mercy and God's a God of grace. And, and, and when I call upon the Lord, he'll hear me. But, but you, you, when you get deeper in words, you realize that we can get to a place where the Lord won't answer us. And we can cut that fellowship off. Why? Is it because of him? No, it's because of us. You got to understand, in the book of Revelation, when Jesus says, I stand at the door and I knock, you got to understand, he's on the outside. And he doesn't knock the door down. He says, you got to open it and let me in. And he says, if you'll have that kind of relationship with me, I'm going to come in. I'm going to sup with you. I'm going to dine with you. I'm going to boat with you. I'm going to give you revelation. I'm going to do all these awesome things. But 
You better make sure that you love me with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Well, let's make it real then about how we, we, we all value wholeheartedness, don't we? Come on. I mean, think of the practical things of life. I mean, what if you went out to eat when church service was over and, and the waiter or the waitress came, came to you and they only brought you half of what you ordered on the menu? And, and you were like, I ordered the 10-piece nuggets. Well, that's five. And you were like, but I'm paying for 10. And then they looked at you and they said, well, it's good enough. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we come to church and we're like, well, it's good enough. Yeah, I'll be glad I'm here, Jesus. Are you getting this? I mean, who would agree with me? You value wholeheartedness when it's displayed to you, right? What if that same waiter or waitress went by the table and they saw your empty glass and they filled it up about halfway? Oh, that's good. And you, and you looked at them and you said, you can fill that up to the top. And they said, no, that's good enough. Come on, y'all get in this, don't you? Now, why do we, come on, let's get real today. Why do we, when it comes to our service to the Lord, it's like we're doing God a service for doing some of these things. And we're like, Gee, that's good enough, Jesus. Hey, y'all, hey, you know, and, and when we come to church, you know, some people, you know, now don't get me wrong. I get it. We're all growing, but God's blessed you. And he says, bring a tithe. And we just kind of throw a tip. We're not tithing. We're tipping. Here you go, God. I'm going to tip you for, you know, taking care of me. Tip. Are you kidding me? And then we were like, it's good enough, right? It's good enough. How many of you, if you took your vehicle into a mechanic this week, and you have children, and you understand the safety of your children hinges on a working and functioning vehicle, came in there, and you told that mechanic, there's something wrong with my tires, and when they went out to the cash register, they looked at you, and they said, we, light, we tightened your lug nuts about halfway, but that's good enough, right? You'd be like... I want to talk to the manager. And he looked at you and he said, I'm not the manager. I'm the owner. Deal with it. You owe us $59.50. But, but that's good enough, right? I mean, we did tighten them. We didn't tighten them all the way, but at least we tightened them. So how many of you in here can say you value wholeheartedness when you're on the receiving end of it? How about if you went to the dentist's office this week and he stopped halfway through the root canal? Tell me you don't value wholeheartedness. Or you go to a surgeon and he removed just half the cancer. And then he brings a report and he said, well, it's still there, but at least I got half of it. How about if you, some of you this week only made half of your electric bill, paid half your gas, paid half your mortgage? You'd know it real quick, wouldn't you? Let's put this next PowerPoint picture up here, Bill. When it comes to our relationship with God, anything less than a whole heart is a deceitful balance. Because James says and Jesus says, if that's the way we're going to serve the Lord, well, that's good enough, Jesus. We are deceiving ourselves. Let's put that next graphic up here. It's some tough stuff, isn't it? Come on. It's some tough stuff. I hear this from a lot of people, and I make the statement myself. I have a relationship with Jesus. It's all about relationship, and it's not religion, right? It is about relationship, right? Well, let's put this next one. Well, let's see. What's the definition of a relationship? A relationship is defined as an involvement between separate parties by blood or marriage, an emotional or other connection between people. Well, that's, you know, that's kind of generic, right? An involvement between separate parties by blood and marriage. Well, let's look at this next definition. Because when, when you look at that, when you look up the word involve, this is what involve means. This is, what, this is where a relationship really gets deep. To engage or interact, to combine, to engage with the interests, emotions, or commitment of, to overwhelm or to merge 
or to tangle together. So when you take the definition of relationship and you take the definition of involved and you put them two together and you really study what Scripture talks about when it comes to a relationship with our Lord, this is really what it means. Let's put this next graphic up here. The term relationship means there is a two-way involvement of intimacy, agreement, covenant, interaction, communication, emotion, investment, and sacrifice. And if in our relationship with the Lord, if we say, I have a relationship with Jesus, but there's not a two-way, what, what, is, what, is, what is two-way involvement means? Jesus died and gave it all. And then when I gave my heart to him, I said, Lord, I give you my all. That's a two-way involvement. A one-way involvement is, Jesus, you gave it all, but I'm not going to give it all. I'm not going to love you the way your word says I should love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Some of us need to get our walk with the Lord ushered into the relationship stage. Now, I know it might be scary. I'm serious. It might be scary. But it's the most satisfying relationship you will ever know. Brian, and I know... Your testimony, my, when, when, when I came out of drugs and alcohol, I need God to be real. Because I'd grow up and I'd go to church on Christmas and Easter and I'd go to Sunday school every once, or not Sunday school, but VBS every, every once in a while, every few years we'd go. And I'd hear of this God and I'd go to church and I'd see the cross on the stage and I would hear the choir sing and I'd hear the preacher talk about it, Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, Jesus, yeah, I, I, be, I believe. I, I be, yeah, I, I think, you know. But all I knew was the religious form and the religious function. I had no idea what an interactive relationship, two-way relationship with the creator of the universe was all about. I had no idea what it was. And that's why when I got into my teen years and I got involved with everything, it, it wasn't a two-way relationship. It wasn't a two-way I wasn't serving God. I didn't care to serve God. But hey, man, I believe you existed. Mental assent will not get you into heaven. The Bible says the devils believe, but they tremble. They're not serving the Lord. They know he exists. So knowing he exists doesn't mean you're right with the Lord. It is when you have a true relationship with him. And you love him with all of your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. And the fruit you're bearing confirms it. It's a two-way involvement. It's intimacy. It's agreement. Lord, I, I don't really like this portion of scripture. But I'm in agreement with it. Because you put it in here. And like James says, it's a mirror and it's exposing to me the things that I need to adjust in my life. You're God, I'm not. I'm in agreement with you. I'm in covenant with you. I'm in covenant. That means nothing else will get in the way of me serving you and loving you. That I'm not going to flee to another idol and I'm not going to run off and do things that I know. that are, I'm in covenant with you, Jesus, forever till I take my last breath. Jesus, my life is yours. I have interaction with him. You know, it's amazing. As a pastor, I, I talk with people all the time. And, and when I counsel people and I talk with people, I have to ask, how's your prayer? I do. I have, I, listen, that's part of my role. I have to. And, and people's lives are maybe struggling in an area. And I'm like, how's your prayer life? Listen, I understand my Father which art in heaven. Holy is your name. I understand that part of the prayer. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I understand that part. But then we got to transition to the, give me this day my daily bread. and Lead me not into temptation. And now we've got to get into a place to where we understand the love of God and we interact with that. And there, there is a, a personal interaction with, with the Lord. And now it comes to where I can now talk with him and share my heart with him and share my hurts and share my burdens and share my struggles. And I know that he might tell me something I don't like. But because he loves me, He's only saying it because he wants my best. There's an inter there's communication. 
It's, it's funny because you, you talk to people and you're like, yeah, I was talking to the Lord today. And religious people flip out over that. It, am I right? Religious people flip out. What, what do you mean? That's blasphemy. You, you talk to God. Well, yeah, it's in Scripture. I, I, he talks to me, and, and I talk to him, and I have an ear to hear his voice. And uh, Doesn't the Bible say, he that hath an ear to hear? So he's talking. It's crazy. Religious people get all upset when, when, when you talk to them and you're like, man, I was at prayer this week and I really felt the Lord speak this to me. What? Whoa. Hey, hey, hold on. What? Well, hold on. This is a relationship, man. Then it's emotion. It's an investment. And it's sacra. I got, I got to move on because we're going to get a little bit deeper here. Let's put this next. <laughs> you're like, you're, you guys are like, man, it's all right. <laughs> Woo. These three points is what we're going to end off. According to Scripture, our love for Jesus, our love for 1 John, it's all found in verse 3 to 17, and it can be broken down into these three categories, okay? Our love for the Lord, our devotion to Jesus, we'll talk about it. We'll see what 1 John says. How we treat others, we addressed that earlier, now it really opens it up. And then our relationship with the world. It's Let's just see what the word has to say, Bill. Let's just spend some here. Number one, our devotion to Jesus, okay? Here's the first part. 1 John 2, verse 3. Hereby we know that we know him. There's that word know again. That word is, is intimacy. It is, it is a knowing that only two people married. It's, a, it's a, a, a passionate love and intimacy. This is how I know that I have that kind of relationship with him. I'm going to keep his commands. Look at verse 4. He that says, I know him. How many of you know I'm just reading you scripture? I didn't author this. This isn't my opinion. He that says, I know, I have a relationship with him, and I don't keep his commands. I'm not saying this. God says we're a liar. We're lying. And the truth is not in us. Verse 5, but whoever keeps the word in him, the love of God is perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. So the first part is how we live our life. It is our love toward him. I, I don't think I need to add, I, listen, I really believe that most of us I have a pretty good idea how close we are to Jesus. All you got to do is look at your life. So it's our devotion to Jesus. Right there it was in the Word. Well, we get into that, how we treat others. This is, some of you are like, would you hurry up and end this? Now you're going to, is it? How many of you know sometimes the preacher goes from preaching to meddling? Can I meddle for a couple of minutes? First John 2, verse 6. Let's look at this. Now, let me say this. God's still working on me with this one. How many wants to be honest with me and say, God's still working with me on this one? Can we be, come on, let's be honest. Because some people are great to get along with. And some people, just flat out it takes, I got to nail my hand to the cross physically to, to keep myself from doing something. Come on, can we, can we be honest? Some people are easy to love. Some people are real hard to love. Yep. Right? Yep. So Jesus says, he that saith, he abideth. Here we go. There's that intimacy word again. Ought himself also so to walk as he walked. So now the Bible is saying, I got to walk like Jesus. Well, man, I can't do it in my own strength. I can't either. That's why he lives in you. You yield to him and let him live it through you. Next verse. <laughs> brethren, I write no new commandment, but the old commandment, which you've heard from the beginning. Jesus reiterated it. I began the service with that in Matthew. The old commandment is the word which you've heard from the beginning. Look at the next verse. <laughs> Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true, because the darkness is past and the true light now shines. Verse 9. He that saith that he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Amen. 
I don't hate my, well, how do you treat them? How do you talk about them? Come on. When they hurt you, how do you feel? You feel hurt, right? Come on, let's be honest in here. Listen, my, listen, my first response, punch them. I'm being, that's my first response. Now, when I struggle, I go back to James and I get it in the mirror. Come on, how many is here with me? Something happens in life and something got you all discombobulated, right? And you're like, I got to look in the mirror, see what happened, right? Come on, who's with me? Well, that's what James says. When something happens to you because you're human, the only way you overcome it is you got to get in the Word. i got to see what the Word says on this one. Lord Jesus, you got to help me. you got to help me. Everything in me says punch him. What's your Word say? Let me look in the mirror. Okay, when I looked in the mirror, my flesh said punch him. But then when I looked in the mirror, the Bible said i got to love him and forgive him. Oh, Jesus. And what did James say? Don't walk away and be a forgetful here. Listen, you don't know how many times I've got to run to the word when I'm struggling. And i got to put it before me. And I'm like, Lord, you said it, not me. Help me. Jesus, everything in me. I know this is what you said. But because I love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and I'm in a relationship with you, and I don't want to grieve the Holy Spirit, and I don't want to break your heart, Jesus, give me the strength. And Mark taught about it in the men's lesson. Even Jesus had to say, if it be possible, pass this cup, but nevertheless. Nevertheless, I get in the word, my flesh does want to do one thing, but my heart says, no, I love Jesus. Nevertheless, because my love for Jesus outweighs the response my flesh wants to do. Next verse. The way you treat people. He that loveth his brother abides in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hates his brothers in darkness and walks in darkness and has no idea where they're going because the darkness has blinded their eyes. Hate, yeah. Offenses. Jesus said, make sure you don't let offenses take root in you. Don't let it happen. You might not be at the hate stage, but I'm telling you, if you dwell on things and you can't get away with thinking and dwelling and constantly thinking and replaying in your mind what that person did to you, if you don't uproot it now, it will lead to this. And that's why you got to get in the Word and let the mirror show you and pray that the Holy Spirit give you help. And because He abides in you, He'll give you the grace you need. I promise you. So now it's our devotion to Jesus. Secondly, it's the way we treat others. And finally, it's our relationship with the world. We move on to verse 15. Same chapter, 1 John chapter 2. Is is this kind of old-fashioned preaching today? (laughs) How many of you know you don't hear this everywhere? Oh, you prayed the prayer? Just go out and live your best life and just do what you want to do. You're saved by grace anyway. I don't. Did we not see the word today? Yes, we are saved by grace. You better believe it, but we got to live out what we claim. So a relationship with God, a relationship with others, now a relationship with the world. Now this, some of you are like, check, check this one. Ouch. Love not the world. Near the things that are in the world. Now you're like, but pastor, you just said we got to love people. That, there's a difference between loving the, the world's way of living in the world system and being worldly and carnal. Jesus went into the world and the world knew him not. He went to change it, not let the world change him. Well, we got to get around the loss in order for the, for the we got to, Jesus, you know, I, I hear this a lot. Well, Jesus fellowship with sinners. Yo, you better believe he did. And I do too, to change them, not to let them rub off on me. Because I'm the light. They're not. Because I cannot let their ways on me. 
Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. What does that mean? I don't live like people that don't know Jesus. And if you can't tell a difference between the way you live and the way somebody that doesn't know Jesus lives, you need to check what? Your relationship. Love not the world, neither the things that are in it. If any man love the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. It's right there. Next verse. So we got another verse on that, Bill. We got to verse 17. Verse 16. For all that's in the world. What's, what's the world? What, what are you talking about? I got to live in the world. The Bible says I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world. And when I got born again, I became part of his kingdom. And I'm not going to let the world's way of doing things, which is outside of God, now control the way I live. I'm going a whole different direction. That's what repent means. We covered that the first lesson. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh. So this is what, how, how do I know I'm worldly? How do I know I'm carnal? How do, how do I know I'm loving the world? Well, what's your flesh doing? What's your flesh engaging into? What are your eyes watching? What about the pride of life? Where, where are you at when it comes with pride? All of this, none of this is of the Father. It is of the world. Verse 17. Do I have verse 17 in there? Yes. And the world's going to pass, and all the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We need to understand that God determines what he expects out of the relationship. Let me close with this. Not us, him. Let me, let me close, and our musician can come up. Let me, let me close with this question. Where is your relation? After hearing this message today, where is your relationship with the Lord? Let's all stand.